Welcome to another edition of uh, Legends of Motorsport. With me today, David Oxton. Thanks for being here, David. Pleasure, Ian. How did it start for you? What was, where did you catch the bug? The word lucky has to be right at the front of this discussion because I was lucky to be one of the many sons of, of a family or a dad, especially in motorsport at the time that, um, yeah, just, I'm, I'm thinking immediately, Jim Palmer, Graham Lawrence, um, Frank Radis, sorry, Paul Radisich, Craig Baird, uh, you know, Ken Smith, we all have the, this common theme of a motorsport family be, behind us, a dad that was really just eat, eat, breathe and slept motorsport. In my case, dad was uh, always keen, but he'd come to New Zealand uh, in 1952 and he'd really set up his little business called Oxton or Nortox Motors, Nortox Engineering, whatever it was at the time, and became uh, involved helping Eric Mallard bringing or garaging the, the Grand Prix cars for you know the, what was the New Zealand Grand Prix. So at that stage when I went to work I would see Dad with his Cooper Bristols and his Cooper Climaxes and his Lotuses and so naturally it was a, a thing to follow. And over the years Reg Parnell became really a, a standard visitor at the garage every year and so I became a gopher on one of his cars and uh, did a Tasman series including Australia when I was about 15. So, you know, it was natural that sometime I would hopefully find a way. So in that mid-teen mid era of me being a gopher, my dad had bought a, 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 a SP250 Dart, Daimler Dart, which was a sports car, quite fast. It was a write-off. A lot of dad's cars were write-offs that he rebuilt. And so he raced that and uh, hill climbed it and eventually uh, I got involved in the hill climbing. When I say eventually, I was probably 17 or 18. Why did you start racing in an SP250? It's <laughs> not exactly, you know, every boy's dream of a racing car, is it? Well, back then it was, because it was a V8, and it was four speed, and it was a sporty car. So you felt like, you know, a bit of a, a, bit of a, a Jack the Lab when you were driving around it. They were fast, they were, you know, capable of uh, 156, I think in the old days of Pookie language, whatever track that was, I can't even think. Maybe the long track, stable track. But um, yeah, they, they were a bit of a tank, I suppose. They didn't have power steering and we had to, Dad put power brakes on it to make it able to be stopped. And there was a half a dozen, a dozen of us raced them sporty guys like um, mates that used to get together and get a dozen beer and a, Bacardi, a bottle of Bacardi and go out to Chamberlain Road and, and, and have a hill climb on a Sunday and, uh, and then eventually race to Pukekohe. So, so that started the, the circuit stuff. The Daimler was, the, the word lucky comes in again. This was my drive car. So when I say drive car, Dad, I'll buy the car off you. I'll pay you five pounds a week for it. As we all know that that did nothing but the, the system of contributing was, was there, and I paid five pounds a week and drove it to my apprenticeship job at R Rover, T. McMillan Rover, they were at the time, in Green Lane. But that car was so much off the road, either through modification or damage repair, that he said, I think we better look, f look at getting you a bomb, and we move up to something more like, um, like a racing car. So that's when we managed to acquire the ex Dougie Lawrence, ex Don McDonnell Lola Mark I sports car. Was it much of a step up? I mean, for you, did you suddenly go, wow, this, this, I'm, I'm in the big time now? No, um, no, I think I was a good poser in those days. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't mind having the, 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 the fun at the racetrack and, and all that went with it. And so it was a natural step up to go to the, the Lola sports car. And that brought in new new new, new uh, challenges like running against Andy Buchanan in the Ferrari and Jim Boyd in the La Coming and the Stanton brothers in their big Chev Corvette. And that was the first year that Jim Murdoch and I went around the country uh, at to, to the summer series of races. So as I keep saying, lucky, I mean, how many kids of sort of under 19 were able to just go off at Christmas and go away four weeks racing? I think that it's, uh, you know, you have to be special. You have to be yeah, pretty lucky. Then you went to, you know, a proper racing car, some people mm. would say. You went to the 1.5 Brabham. Yep. How much of a step was it? Uh, when you go to the racetrack, 
the, the older brigade keep an eye on the new brigade coming through, and I'm sure that still applies, as we well know how Kenny's looked at all the young drivers as they've come through. But in my case, it was Rolly Levis, and Rolly had, Rolly had successfully run 1.5 uh, national formula cars, as they were called. Um, he, he was the champion, and he was, he was the man to beat. And we were, we were at Pukekohe for a test day, and, and he came over and he said to Dad, how about you give David a few laps in my car just to see what he thinks? So, of course, no one needed a second invitation, <laughs> least of all me. And so I jumped into number 10. Rolly was the watcher, and Dad was there like any expectant father watching every lap. And he said, he's going pretty good, David, uh, Steve, but I think I'll bring him in. He's going a bit too quick now. And that was the common sense, knowledgeable person who could see that possibly the person that was doing it was outside his uh, skill zone, whatever, and he didn't want it to go bad for either him or me. The Lola, yeah. even though it was a, a, I suppose you'd say a proper race car, yeah. it was still a sports car and it was still quite old, right? But the problem was, you know, you're getting up, getting right into modern machinery. Mm. Was it a big step? I didn't remember it as being a challenge. It was. It was neat because it had wider rear wheels. I could see the wheels. And anyone who's been in a Formula Ford, or been up through the ranks of single-seaters, knows the joy of jumping into a single-seater for the first time and seeing the wheels wiggle when you turn the steering wheel and see the brake, well, in the case of the old cars, see the rubber brake hoses expand <laughs> when you braked on them. I used to hate that in George Begg's 5000 car the first time I tested it. I jumped on the brakes so hard and they went out like balloons. And I thought, my God, can't we get steel hoses? They've got this new air equipped stuff, George. Can't we get it? <laughs> so, um, but, but, but the single seater thing, they are wonderful in the sense of, and you'll hear all the great drivers refer to the, the driving of a single seater as you become one with the car. And what they mean is that when you do anything you feel it not just in your hands but in your whole body and so you know when it's doing what it should be doing because you're part of it. And that sounds a bit emotional and gushy but, but it does and it does. The, and I used to say to people with Formula Ford, you know when you've, ex, you, when you've achieved it in Formula Ford racing, when you're going through the corner and it's neither understeering or oversteering, sliding or gripping, it's just it's just positioned beautifully that you and the car are going through that corner as fast as you can in one perpetual motion. A lot of people perhaps wonder why you started young but you didn't take that move, you didn't mm. go there and you know buy a Formula 3 car and sleep <laughs> in a tent and you know do okay. that whole thing. I didn't have that burning ambition that Howden Ganley did, that Bert Hawthorne did, Jim Murdoch did, yep. to go and give it a crack. I freely admit I was a homeboy, I enjoyed the relationship in, in, that I have with my team and my friends in New Zealand, but I didn't have that, that, that killer instinct to go the whole way to race for, to try and break into the big time. 1970, uh, I've got a little note here that, that you drove a Lotus 70 Formula 5000 car at Sebring, yeah. and one of the guys somehow involved in it was Andy, Andy Granatelli, yes. the STP guy? Yes. Was he a re I mean, he must, that must have been an amazing time. Yeah, well, started, it started go back a year when um, a driver called Mike Goth came from America and his two mechanics, Joe Cavalieri and Bruce Burness, were the, were the American guys who first trip abroad, came to New Zealand, and I was more than happy to jump on board as their gopher. Bruce and Joe had connections with, um, with George Fulmer, and so they convinced him to uh, give me a drive in one of their cars, one of Lotus cars. I arrived in LA, my first trip, drove across a, um, to Miami and down to Florida. So it was a three-day non-stop journey, pretty much, no motels, and, uh, and, and that was a great race, went good for us, qualified well in, in, in a car I hadn't driven before and finished fourth. But what I was trying to do at that time was to get a hold of this Lotus from Lotus Cars and bring it to New Zealand for uh, the second year of Formula 5000. So then we ran the international, we well, got planned to come to the, the, um, the 5000 series, ran a great Levin, <clears throat> again I think a fourth place, 
But more importantly, I'm not sure whether Chris was a hot behind me or ahead of me. I'd like to think he was behind me, but Chris Amon, I'm talking. Yep. Chris was in the March 701, which was an STP-sponsored car, right. entered and run by Andy, uh, sorry, Vince Granatelli with English Mechanics, and uh, yeah, it was a good team. And uh, Vince, Vince had decided that this Lotus must be really much better than the March because if I was able to be uh, more than competitive against Chris. So Vince, Vince made an appointment to come and see us at Dad's workshop and he said, look, um, you, you've got two, uh, two chances here, David. Uh, we've got great connections with Lotus and uh, we can, we can, you can get out of the Lotus and give it to Chris or we just take it off you, whichever you like. And I said, well, I have an arrangement with Lotus Cars. And he said, oh, I'll fix that. And he picks up Lotus, and of course, Lotus Cars dropped me like a hot potato because Granatelli was a big customer at Indy. My relationship with, with, the, with the, the Lotus guys uh, deteriorated, not with the Americans. They're very, very good. And Ryan Falconer, <laughs> he's an engine builder who I still, I, uh, to this day, still communicate and visit. I saw him just a month ago in the States. And um, Ryan used to have a very limited vocabulary on sorting out business. He said, David, I'll, I'll loan you the engine and you send it back exactly as it looks there. And if you don't, I'll come down and I'll break every bone in your body. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this goes back to what I said at the beginning about, about friendships, luckiness, luck and all that stuff. I mean, you, you build up connections through your, 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 your growth in sport, I suppose, or anything in life. And if you do the right thing by people, things, things grow and you can, you can benefit from it. What, what did come out of it was George Begg in, in, in Drummond in Deep South who had been building cars for many, many years and building his skills, ex-McLaren, he'd been to McLaren's and worked with Bruce. George had a, an unusual way of doing business and good, a good mate of yours and mine, I think, Alan Dick, Alan Dick was, was asked to ask me if I would like to ask George <laughs> to drive his car. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a bit funny, but that was George's way. He wouldn't ever offer he said he didn't offer someone a drive. If someone wanted to ask him, he'd go away and consider it. I've been racing for over 30 years and without the help of the motorsport volunteers, we just couldn't do what we do. So check out the action and fun you can have behind the scenes and get involved. Are you looking for that special property where you can house your cars in decent shedding or maybe have that man cave? If you're looking for an apartment here at Hampton Downs or to sell one, give me a call at Ray White Tuakal. My name and number's here on the door of the car. Takapuna Panel Beaters, family owned and operated for over 50 years, licensed for all insurance work. Marty, Michelle and the team can handle anything from small dings to large repairs and specialise in structural damage. Takapuna Panel Beaters, Hillside Road, Glenfield. Sandbrook Windscreens, New Zealand's leading supplier of boat windscreens, heated classic race and rally car windscreens. Your one stop shop for all custom made glass and polyglass windscreens, rear screens and side windows. Sandbrook Windscreens, a clear shot above the rest. Let's just step back just a little bit. In 72, as you say, you, you, you'd you won the, the New Zealand Formula Ford Championship and the prize was a, a trip to the Formula Ford Festival in England, wasn't it? Yeah. So that was it. David Oxton was finally in Europe <laughs> racing a car. How was the festival? How did you do? Did you like it? Was it a shock? Well, let's go back a little bit too. The first year was... was uh was pretty neat. Uh, the second year was even better with Jim Murdoch running with his Titan he brought home. So I had this brilliant, really, really original idea. Why don't we just paint the, the car like Dad's cigarette packet, the Rothmans packet. <laughs> so we got the painter to paint it white and with blue beadings around it and gold lines along it. It was put on top of its race trailer and I drove it down to Fort St um, Custom Street, I think it is, so where the Rothmans head office was, right on the corner of Queen Street and Custom Street, knocked on the door and asked to see Mr. Simich. 
And he, he asked me in and, uh, and I said, I'd like you to look out the window. And he looked out at the car down there and said, that looks very nice. What's that? It's, it's, a, it's a Brabham single seater and Rothman's colors. And, yeah, very nice. What do you want? Well, blah, blah, blah. So the long and short was, well, you know, it's, it's a board decision. We can't make a decision now, but we'll stay in touch. And the following year, we had the first commercial sponsorship of the country of that level. So the Lexington was the first, the first car that we ran, and there was a couple of others in that team. Cambridge was masses of cars, yeah. and beauti uh, another beautiful one-liner of Graham Lawrence's. Uh, Graham, you're not with um, Cambridge, are you? No, nah, no. Nah. Cambridge is like assholes. Everyone's got one. <laughs> so. OK, I'm going to ask you again, because you... <laughs> you obviously didn't have a good time at the Formula 4. No, no, I didn't. Tell me about the Formula 4. No, no, Four I had a wonderful. Okay, so then <laughs> Formula 4, we won the Formula 4 championship and, and, and uh, had a great send off night at, at the Auckland Car Club. So the prize was go to England and, and, and get to the World Formula 4 final at uh, Brands Hatch in October, something or other. So I've always been relatively organised in my life. I'd like to think I have. Maybe that was the good training I had. And I thought, well, there's no point in just turning up at the British circuit of Brands Hatch and expecting to do well. So we, would, we went two months before. And I remember being on the grid on the first race I ever went to in England, and I was 33rd in a 33-car grid. And, <laughs> and, and Alan Jones wandered right down to the back of the grid, and he sort of said, you're a long way back, Kiwi. You're a long... <laughs> Wasn't, he wasn't wrong. So we had a lot to learn about racing in the UK, but fortunately picked it up pretty well and over the time had some pretty good races. So there was something like 40, 40 guys turns up, turned up to Brands Hatch. So we managed to get on fastest practice time on the first day of practice at Brands and then fastest in the second practice and got pole. So it was looking good. But that's, that's pretty impressive at the festival. Yeah, it was. Yeah, well, it was, uh, it, was, it was kind of one up from the festival. It was the World Formula Ford final. But of course, um, stage fright must have got me. I, I managed to crash it on the first lap. And so uh, that's probably why you said it didn't work out. Well, it, it kind of didn't work out, but, but it was a wonderful trip, the whole thing. The next golden era was a very golden era for you, wasn't it? Which was Pacific. Yeah. And I remember the first, personally I can remember the first race meeting for Pacific in New Zealand yep. and it was at Bay Park, yep. the New Year's meeting or yep. that meeting, and there was a guy there that um, stunned us all really and yeah. probably stunned you, is Kakia Rosberg? Yeah. Was that an eye opener? Um, of course it was, because uh, not, not because of where he was relative to me, but his, his professionalism, his standard, his Europeanisation. You, you remember that we hadn't really seen that sort of driver. 5,000 was, I won't say older guys, but they weren't youngsters. When KK, as you said, turned up at Bay Park, well, he was the new, the new kid on town. He was the new way of doing things. He came to Pocket Coe and he taught us all on how you how you drive chicanes and big Kiwis and we we love our equipment you know but when this Rosberg bastard arrived <laughs> he taught us that you don't go around chicanes you go over them and we're all basically wanting to protest this this is ridiculous I mean look at the guy he's driving like a lunatic he wreck his car well, that's the way we do it in Europe son so the Chevron fortunately withstood all this stuff and KK was just magnificent to watch when he was Ten tenths, you know, and he was usually ten tenths. Everything about KK was ten tenths. His living, his 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 smoking, his drinking, his woman. He was just that sort of guy, and it, and it was just a, an incredible um, couple of years. There were a few parties at Willow Park, well, and I'm sure that KK was in, in the middle of all of that, wasn't he? Well, K KK's classic one was, was was Christchurch at Travelodge, and his teammate was one of these early to bed, early to rise clowns, and. Um, Mika, Mika had gone to bed and, 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 and KK and a few of us were having drinks or whatever at dinner time. And he said, come upstairs, we'll, we'll, we'll fix Mika. And I said, oh. So there was five or six of us guiltily followed him up like we lieutenants. And so he said, when we go in the room, just all go to three on each side, three on the other, and collapse the mattress around him. OK, so we got that worked out. So we go in and we, he's asleep. 
three on each side, collapsed the mattress around him. We carried it through the door, down the stairs, into the foyer, across the lounge, across and out through the restaurant and into the swimming pool. <laughs> and he was stark naked. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but that, that was the, they were the sort of things that you, that you did. They were pretty harmless fun, really. Um, but, um, I mean, I just can't imagine that sort of stuff going on today. I, I'm sure it doesn't. Well, I don't think so. You've done for your son, or your sons, what your father did for you, didn't you? Was that, was that fun? Was that, did you oh. understand what your father had done for you then? Anyone that's been involved with, and I started the story talking about luck, and I say, and how I got in. in. In all the racing, and it doesn't matter what sport, what avenue of the sport, it's very important that you have stickability. If you, in today, like we, call, we say millennials are very much in and out sort of people, that won't work in racing or any sport. You've got to have full commitment. So in our thing with the boys, um, I just loved it almost, I don't know how I can say better than when I was doing it, but anyone who's been a dad of a guy, of, of, a, of a child, not remembering that it's boys and girls today, will, will understand and remember and, and get, see what I'm getting at. The thrill of doing it with your own is, is, is almost better than doing it yourself. A father of a son who's demanding can be, can be a pain in the neck. And most teams, big teams, will tell you, you're all right, but keep your father out of it because they get to a certain point by, by, by doing things a certain way, but they can't walk into an established team and expect to have that control. And we've seen Lewis Hamilton and his dad break up and now thankfully come back together. We've seen, um, I remember Gary Rogers saying, <laughs> famously said to, to um, Scott McLaughlin, now Scott, uh, I, I love to hear that you've come from Ross Stone Racing. When you were at Stone Brothers, did you take mum and dad into work? No, and you don't hear either. <laughs> <laughs> Karting is the best sport ever. I had only six years in it, but what a way to get into motorsport. And if you, a father and son sport, wonderful. David, thank you very much for your time. You've been a wonderful guest uh, here on, on uh, Legend, so thank you very much. Thank you again. I've been racing for over 30 years and without the help of the motorsport volunteers, we just couldn't do what we do. So check out the action and fun you can have behind the scenes and get involved. Are you looking for that special property where you can house your cars in decent shedding or maybe have that man cave? If you're looking for an apartment here at Hampton Downs or to sell one, give me a call at Ray White Tuakal. My name and number's here on the door of the car. Takapuna Panel Beaters, family owned and operated for over 50 years, licensed for all insurance work. Marty, Michelle and the team can handle anything from small dings to large repairs and specialise in structural damage. Takapuna Panel Beaters, Hillside Road, Glenfield. Sandbrook Windscreens, New Zealand's leading supplier of boat windscreens, heated classic race and rally car windscreens. Your one stop shop for all custom made glass and polyglass windscreens, rear screens and side windows. Sandbrook Windscreens, a clear shot above the rest. October 1965, New Zealand saloon car racing changed forever. Why? Because of this car. This is Ivan Sedgden's Fleetwood Motors Mustang, and this is New Zealand's very first racing Mustang. This car started life as a 1965 K-Code GT Mustang. A K-Code was the fastest Mustang that you could buy directly off the showroom floor that wasn't a Shelby GT350. This car was to be built to FIA Group 2 regulations, which were in use at the time in Great Britain, Europe, Australia, and would be introduced into New Zealand for the 1965-66 season. So how do you convert a Mustang road car 
into a full-blown Group 2 race car? Well, you pay a visit to Shelby American in California, buy yourself a stack of race car parts, ship them home to New Zealand, a few late nights in the workshop, and a legend is born. Ivan raced the car for two seasons, and it did actually show quite a lot of promise. He finished third outright in the Group 2 points championship, and he won his class. But there were problems. Handling issues, braking issues, mechanical issues, and these continued into the second season. And after a couple of big engine failures, Ivan had had enough. He decided to sell the car, complete with broken engine, and he walked away. Into Red Dawson. Dawson bought the car in 1967. He built a new engine for it and went racing the following season. He won a non-championship race at Levels Raceway, the first ever event at Levels Raceway. But in the eight round championship, he scored points in just one race. Mechanical failures continued with the car and in 1968 he'd had enough. He decided to convert the car into a road car and he sold it. For the next 20 years it lived an anonymous life as a road car and it wasn't until Glenn Larson bought it in 1986 that he restored it cosmetically back to the Fleetwood Motors colour scheme. But Glenn kept the car as a road car and it wasn't until 2004 and its next owner Neil Tollich that it returned to the racetrack once more. Neil raced the car extensively in historic events both in New Zealand, Great Britain and Europe. In 2018 he sold it to its current owner Sean McCorn. The Fleetwood Motors Mustang, a legend, New Zealand's very first racing Mustang. And it's still competing to this day in historic events up and down the country. Hello everybody, I'm John Tomlin and welcome to the Historic News Spot, brought to you by Sandbrook's windscreens for classic cars with heated and plastic windscreens for race and rally cars. Today we're going to talk about the SAS Auto Parts and MSC Formula 5000 series. These fearsomely fast small block V8 single seaters from the 60s and 70s have already completed round one at the Sound MG Classic at Circuit Chris Amon Manfield in November. There are four more rounds to the series being 18 and 19th of January, historic Grand Prix at uh, Bruce McLaren Motorsport Park. First and second of February, Scope Classic Mike Pirro Motorsport Park Ruapuna. 15th and 16th of February, South and Car Club's George Begg Memorial Meeting in Teratonga with a final round the 21st and 22nd of March, HRC Legends of Speed Hampton Downs. New Zealand has led the world for many years with the revival of Formula 5000 racing. To talk about the coming season, SAS Auto Parts MSC Formula 5000 season, joining me today is current Formula 5000 Association President, Glenn Richards. Welcome to the show, Glenn. Hey, good to be here, John. Cheers. Nice to have you. So, Glenn, you guys have uh, got a good season coming out with some cars coming out of uh, Australia and the uh, UK. The first one uh, that we do after Christmas will be at Taupo, and that's a, that's a meeting that's just getting stronger and stronger every year. It's a fantastic place to go. Five-time champion Kenny Smith aside, um, you know, the series is really about the cars, isn't it? Yep. It yeah, is. So, yep. now, you uh, compete yourself. Yep. You've got a... Tell us a little bit about what you've got. I run a uh, Lola T400 there, which is the last of the Lolas that was made for Formula 5000. It came after the 332, which is a really successful chassis, and they mucked around with it with the 400, and they didn't really get it right. At the yeah, beginning. that was that rising rate suspension, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, so they tried to get the suspension inboard, but nobody knew how to tune it. So my car was an example of one that was changed quite quickly. Formula 5000 is broken into two classes, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. So we that. have the older cars um, in one class, and we, which we call Category A. I think it's uh, pre-69, pre-70, um, and that's the older cars in there. And then the B category is the more modern cars, which have got a pace advantage. So that's generally McRae's and Lola's. It's going to be a really good season, yeah, uh, really the remainder of the season. Too. And uh, I can tell you, you're really excited about uh, going to Tar Taratonga. And that's all we have time for this week. I'm John Tomlin with the Sandbrooks Windscreens News Spot. Thanks for watching and we look forward to you joining us next time.